please stand and join us in our first song. doesn't get better than this. Uh, I am excited to have you guys here. I'm Pastor Steve. I'm the pastor here at Bethany Church. For those of you joining us online, welcome. It is great to have you here. I hope you guys are ready to do some celebrating because this is the day that sets all of Christianity apart. Amen. Every other religion, every other worship entity, whatever you want to call it, we serve a risen Christ, and we are the only ones to do so. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's keep singing, guys. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at His feet we Praise will rise. 
his body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the grave. Our God has robbed the your smiling faces. This is wonderful. All right, we welcome you in. Like Pastor said, whether you're in the sanctuary or you're out online, um, we would like you to take a moment and greet one another in the love of Christ. It's a, it's a beautiful sight. Wow. I knew a girl that looked just like you. Please do. Please do. What a treat that would be. Play, want me to play something? Okay, folks, let's uh, make our way back to our seat. <laughs> okay, it's sort of working. Let's make our way back to our seats, please. Not too subtle, then. <laughs> We're almost there. Good morning, Pauline. Please join me this morning in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you on this Easter morning, the holiest of days, with hearts full of gratitude and joy. You love this world so much that you gave your one and only Son who suffered for all of us on the cross and then gloriously captured victory over sin and death. Lord, we thank you for the promise of new life and hope that Easter brings. Help us to experience the transformative power of your love, renewing our spirits and strengthening our faith while calling us to action to spread the good news. And never let us waver in our belief of the resurrection and of the promise of salvation that it brings to us all. Truly, 
today is a day of victory. Be with us, Lord, in our hearts and in our minds, so we hear and understand today's message. We pray all these things in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to ask you to stand again. God sent his son, they call him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior is. This is where the kids who are normally here are thinking, wait a minute, something is out of order. We're supposed to be sitting up here with Miss Susan, right? They were with me last week. They're still asking for Miss Susan. We'll make it up to you guys, I promise, right after service. So what? So what? Yeah, I heard, a, I heard one or two chuckles back there. So what? How's that for an energized opening shot on Easter Sunday? But it is where I left us on Palm Sunday. The last words I spoke during the sermon were, so what? One 
week ago today, we cheered and we celebrated Palm Sunday. Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey to the cries of Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Many of the people had absolutely no idea what they were cheering for. They were doing it just because everybody else was. But the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, rode in prepared for what was to come. A lot took place in that week between Palm Sunday and today. Jesus chased the money lenders and cleansed the temple. He, he chased the money lenders around with a whip, overturning their tables. And boy, would I love to have been there for that. Right? The, the picture we always have of Jesus is him sitting there with a lamb and patting a child on the head and just, you know, the gentler, kinder, kinder Jesus. And yet, on the day after, on Monday, he chased the money lenders. And he cracked the whip and he told him to clear out of his father's house. He taught parables or stories. He would eat the Passover meal, wash his disciples' feet, and celebrate the Lord's Supper, the first one, what we call Holy Communion. Then came the cross, where Jesus would be crucified and would die. And he would be laid in the tomb. So what? When we hear the stories on Easter Sunday, I get the feeling that we too have that sense of the crowd shouting, Hosanna! The sense of the crowd celebrating Easter because it's what so many people do today. We dress up, we go to church, we do egg hunts and eat the ears off poor chocolate bunnies. <laughs> Lunch with family follows, and then, if you're like me, a good afternoon nap. Anybody here a napper on Easter, Easter afternoon? Thank you. I thought I was the only one for the longest time. Easter becomes an image in the rearview mirror of our lives. And we get ready for Monday in our everyday lives. Don't get me wrong. I love all of these things, including the chocolate bunny ears. I love seeing how nice everybody dresses up, and you guys look fantastic today. And I love the stories. I love all the stories that get shared around this time. I love the stories of the women running to the tomb and finding an empty tomb. I love all of it. But I also love the sense of normalcy that follows Easter. And I have to ask the question, so what? Let me ask you another question. What is Easter to more, most folks? What is Easter to most folks? Easter, I think, to most folks, is a, is a date on the calendar. It's a time when we're supposed to come to church. We're supposed to go through the motions that everybody else goes through. But, but for many, it just means very little. It doesn't mean what it's supposed to mean. It's not, it doesn't mean that we serve a risen Christ. That when they got to the tomb, it was empty. That he did what he said he was going to do. It just doesn't seem to mean that anymore. Because I had heard these numbers many years ago, and I just needed to check. Anybody here ever use Google? Right? Right? You can find everything on Google. Everything's on Google. Right? Years ago, I checked this set of numbers. I did a search, and I just typed in the word Easter. And I saw, and then I went over to the images tab, and I wanted to see what popped up. Strangely enough, the numbers that popped up for me 
10 years ago haven't really changed all that much. So I looked at the first 100 images displayed on Google, and do you know what I found? I found seven images that we might associate with Christianity and Easter. Seven out of a hundred. Crosses, the empty tomb. I even found one that had a, a portrayal of Jesus. Ninety-three of the 100 were images of bunnies, chicks, bunnies and chicks, eggs, and bunnies delivering eggs. Ninety-three of the 100. They were colorful, they were playful, and they had absolutely nothing to do with Easter. So, what? So what is an important question for us to ask, and it was crucial to the disciples. It was so crucial to them that the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spent 29 out of a total of 89 chapters that they wrote talking about this week. 32.5% of everything they wrote was about Holy Week from Palm Sunday to Easter. Do you think it was important to them? To those who had walked with, talked with, heard the teachings from of Jesus. Jesus shared all these things with them, and when he was gone, they thought it was important enough that they spent 32.5% of everything they wrote about this week. Three years they traveled with him. Three years. 32.5% of it was about the last week. We ought to be able to answer our question of the day, so what? If we take everything that has come before us into account, if the disciples, the gospel writers, if they thought all of this was that important for us to know about, we ought to be able to answer our question of the day, so what? I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of God's holy word. Our reading today comes from the gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter Verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look! There is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Three days after Jesus was crucified, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, took spices that they had purchased to properly bury Jesus with. And on Sunday morning, the first day of the Hebrew week, they went to the tomb where Jesus had been laid. It's a familiar story to all of us. 
It's a familiar story because we hear it every Easter. Depending on which gospel you're, you're being taught from, it's the same story. It's the women rushing to the tomb. It's a stone rolled away. It's Jesus no longer there kind of story. It's a familiar story following the familiar story of the crucifixion, which follows the familiar stories of the days leading up to those events. In this version of the resurrection, the women encounter a young man, young man dressed in white robes. What he tells them might be glossed over if we don't carefully read the words that God has given us. This angel tells the women that Jesus has been raised and that they are to go and tell the disciples and Peter to meet Jesus in Galilee. The disciples and Peter Peter. Peter's the guy whose proclamation of who Jesus was caused Jesus to respond, Upon you I shall build my church. The guy who stated rather emphatically, I'll never leave nor forsake you. Lord, not me. It's the guy who, for a short period of time, walked on water. This Peter. And it's here that we find that not all who call themselves disciples or students of Christ really are. I've shared this before that if I were to ask a room full of Christians if they were disciples of Jesus Christ, almost everybody would raise their hand. Almost everybody would raise their hand, regardless of what denomination, what church, any of that. Most of them would raise their hands. Peter would have raised his hand. But being a disciple of Jesus requires more than a membership certificate to a local church. It requires dedicated study and a devotion to Jesus' teachings beyond that which most are willing to offer. It means that we not only hear the word, but that we... Oh, you guys can do better than that. It means we can't just hear the word, but we have to. Thank you. Peter was still a bit full of himself, even after three years spent traveling with Jesus. And now, on the day that Jesus was raised from the dead, the angel said, Go tell the disciples and Peter. You see, Peter found himself separated from the group we call the disciples. He had denied Christ not just once, not just twice, but three times. Three times. But, and there's always a but, isn't there? But Peter was about to be confronted not just by the good news, but by the great news. You see, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. There we go. That's somebody who's excited about it. I like that. That's good in church. That'll play. God loves each and every one of us, of us. So much that he sent his only begotten son into the world to die a horrible death on the cross for us. In his second letter to the church in Corinth, Paul wrote, And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for the one who for their sake died and was raised. Who for their sake died and was raised. Who for their sake. The question becomes then, if 
Jesus died for our sake, and if we must not live for ourselves, then what? What is our purpose? Anybody here ever study philosophy? Anybody? Okay, see, right? People who study philosophy, they're like, you say, who studied math? It's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. I studied philosophy. What's the great philosophical question? And I can't mute the guy who controls the audiovisual stuff. The great philosophical question is, why am I here? What is my purpose? Why? Why is all of this, then, so important, my friends? This stuff is important for us and for the Peters of the world. You see, Peter said no to Jesus. He claimed he didn't know him. He had done what seems to us to be remarkably stupid. Monumentally stupid. Peter briefly walked on water. He witnessed all the miracles that Jesus performed. And during Jesus' most vulnerable moment, denied him. But how much like Peter are we? How much like Peter are we? Whether we call ourselves Christian or not, each of us denies the goodness of God regularly. Each of us feels the temptations of the world, and as we give in to temptation, we deny Christ. And when we deny Christ, we turn down the gift that God sent us in the person of Jesus Christ. The question for all of us, even as we cry out, Hosanna, save us. The question for us all is, so what? If our lives aren't changed through our acceptance of Christ and what he accomplished on the cross, so what? If we fail to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves, so what? If we choose to live as the world dictates that we live, if we fail to feed the hungry because we need to save a few bucks, and if we turn away those who aren't like us because they don't dress like us, talk like us, or smell like us, then so what? What is this all for? The cross and the empty tomb become meaningless. But maybe, just maybe, today means something. Maybe Easter is a celebration of your heart rather than a date on your calendar. Maybe God has pinged you to do something more than you've ever thought possible. Maybe you've been called to step out of your comfort zone and wrap your arms around someone not like you. Maybe. Jesus left his disciples with a promise as he prepared them for his departure. He told them that when he left this world, when he left them, he would send the Holy Spirit. And when you are filled with God, the Holy Spirit, nothing, nothing is impossible for you when you step out in faith for the kingdom of God. If Easter doesn't mean anything to the world, then what are we going to do about that? Mark's gospel has a shorter ending to it that I've encountered in preparation for today that not a lot of people know about. But I want to share it with you today as we lean into the so what. After 
the reading that was spoken in your hearing today, the shorter ending of Mark says this, and all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Does it sound vaguely like the Great Commission? The sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. The cross and the empty tomb mean so much more than mere historical facts. They mean Jesus was fully human as he died on the cross. They mean Jesus was fully God as he rose from the dead. And they mean for us that we have hope in this otherwise hopeless world. Hope for you, hope for me, and hope for the Peters of this world. But it's up to us to share the good news and to offer from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. You see, friends, we live in a lost world. We do. Anybody here read the newspaper? Watch the news on television? Check it out on the internet? Do a Google search? You know we live in a hopeless world when you look at the news around us. We, my friends, have to be the beacon of hope that Jesus Christ provides as we share Jesus with the world. My prayer for each of you who hears my voice today, whether you are here or worshiping with us online, my prayer for each of you is that Resurrection Sunday, this day, and on this day, that your hearts are resurrected, raised to life in the fullness of our Lord and Savior, as you move forward in your relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. And as people see you and they see the light of Christ shining through you, the question of so what will be answered. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that this day represents to us. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for for the death that you suffered, the pain that you suffered on the cross. We thank you for all of these things. But Lord, you rose from the dead. That makes this something different than any other prophet, any other supposed deity, Anybody else that people worship, that makes this different. Because, Lord, since we serve a risen Christ, we can go out into our communities and we can be the beacon, the light of Christ as you shine through us and we can bring people hope that they might not otherwise have. We can bring them assurance of what their future holds. And so, Lord, help us to do just that. Help us to be that beacon of light in this fallen world. And when we go from here today, when it's time to leave and and we go on and things seem to getting back to a sense of normalcy, Lord, we pray that you not allow us to return to normal. That you help us to share the word of God. That you help us to, to shine the light of Christ into our communities. That you help us to be the men and women of God that you have created us to be. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. And we pray all these things in your son, Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. As we turn now to our time of offering, one of the things I remind everybody who goes here, actually everybody I talk to really, is that 
when we provide our offerings, there are people who say Jesus never talked about giving, and that's not true. Uh, there are people who say that the tithe and, and offerings are not important, and that's not true. God and Jesus both spoke about our offerings. And when we're told to do something and we do it, when we hear in the Word of God that there is something that we are to accomplish, some commandment that we are to do, and we do it, did you know that that is the very definition of worship? Worship is exactly that, when we hear the Word of God and we do the Word of God. When we do those things, it is worship. And so now as we turn to our time of offering, let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have asked us to be cheerful and obedient givers to your church. And so on this day, Lord, help us to be just that. Help us to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world. And that as as these offerings support your church, that your church supports the community and the people in it, Lord. Help us to do the things that you have commanded us to do. Help us to love our neighbor even as we love you. Bless the hands that so freely give this day. We pray these things in your Son, Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. For those of you worshiping with us online, there's going to be a QR code. For those of you here too, you can use that QR code. I think smartphones nowadays have pretty good range, right? You can hit that QR code. You can get signed up to follow us on our newsletter. Uh, learn, learn about things going on in the church, and this is also a great way to give electronically. Uh, if, you, if you're old-fashioned like me, so like my, my wife's in charge of all the electronic stuff in our house, I'm kind of old school. I like the offering plates. There's offering plates at the back if you'd like to give that way as well. Come. Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Siloam went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body. They saw the angel sitting there and they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire, that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We're going to continue in worship and we're going to um, sing our communion song. We have sang this one before. Um, it's called Flesh and Bone by Zach Williams. There's an old wooden cross 
On top of a hill There's a grave that's been empty For thousands of years There is grace and forgiveness At the table he set The Father's love poured out for us And we won't forget Flesh and bone, blood and timber Bread and wine, we remember Hearts of stone, saved in prison, found the freedom in surrender. The veil was torn, the gates swing open, the battle's won, the war is over. Flesh and bone, blood and timber, bread and wine, we remember. You never asked for anything, you just wanted our hearts. You say the price you paid for us was worth every scar still you meet us with mercy in our shame and our sin the father's love poured out for us again and again flesh and bone blood and timber bread and wine we remember hearts of stone slaved in prison found the freedom in surrender the flail was torn the gates swing open the battle's won the war is over flesh and bone blood and timber bread and wine we remember nothing can separate what the good Lord brings together. If you know his love, then raise your cup. Hallelujah, we remember. Nothing can separate what the good Lord brings together. If you know his love, then raise your cup. Hallelujah, we remember. And nothing can separate what the good Lord brings together. If you know his love, then raise your cup. Hallelujah, we remember. Flesh and bone, blood and timber, bread and wine, we remember. Hearts of stone, saved in prison, found the freedom in surrender. The veil was torn, the gates swing open, the battle's won, the war is over. Flesh and bone, blood and timber, bread and wine, we remember. Flesh and bone, blood and timber, bread and wine, we remember. You may be seated. Please be seated. Yeah. As we turn now to our time of receiving Holy Communion, I'm reminded yet again of stories. The story in particular that I remember was in the day leading up into the Passover meal. And Jesus would gather around the table with his disciples and, and I, can rem- I can imagine his disciples, those who were from the area around Galilee and and. Boy, these folks weren't educated. They weren't, they were fishermen. They were just, that's how they plied their trade. And they find themselves in Jerusalem with Jesus Christ. And as they came in, I imagine them looking around the city. Jerusalem normally had about 100,000 people in the city. On this Passover, it's believed that upwards of a million people we're in Jerusalem. Can you imagine being somebody from the country and, and walking into that kind of scenario and being like, wow. And so I imagine them sitting around the table. I imagine the disciples thinking, wow. And that's what all the chatter was. All while Jesus knew what was coming. He knew the suffering, the pain, and his crucifixion were near. As they were eating, 
Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. One of the other things I'm reminded of, though, is that while this table is an open table, I will never dictate who comes to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But I am reminded that we are called to come in a worthy manner. And so I'm going to invite us all to pray together this prayer of repentance. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken the law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now church, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves his love for us. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Let us bless these elements. Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessings to be poured out on these elements of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ so that your church, redeemed by his blood, might go into all the world, declaring the eternal and imperishable good news that is the gospel. We thank you and we praise you in your son Jesus' name. Amen. The table has been prepared. All are welcome to come. If you require gluten-free elements, just let me know. My wife will be serving with me. Uh, and uh, come.
This is me again, isn't it? <laughs> I've <Twice> before. <clears throat> Friends, this is truly a day of celebration. We celebrate because he has given us the ability to celebrate. He has risen from the dead. And gosh, if that's not something to celebrate, then, then your wood's wet. But don't let it end here, my friends. You cannot let the story end here. You see, when Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven, a new story started. And now you carry that story with you. So if you choose to let it end, that's on you. My prayer is that you will continue the story, that you will reach out into the community, that you will talk to people about who you have in Jesus Christ, and that you will continue to worship him and draw nearer to him all the days of your life. I have two things left to share with you before I turn this over to our praise team. Um, the first of these things is that next Sunday, we will be celebrating our membership Sunday. Right now, we have seven who are going to be joining the church. If you have not yet spoken to me about doing that and you would like to join the church, I would love to talk with you this week. The last thing that I have is we are taking a trip in 2025 to follow in the footsteps of Paul on a trip to Greece. Um, we have brochures out on our activity table. If you are interested, even if you're not a part of this church formally, we would love to have you take a look at that and let us know if you might be interested in going with us. That's all I've got. For my money, it's a pretty good Sunday. Pretty good time of celebration. Thank you for joining us here and celebrating this event, this blessed event with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and I thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done, not just in, in rising from the dead, not just from going to the cross for us, not, not because of any of those individual things, Lord, but because of what you do in us daily that you forgive our sins every time we turn to you and ask for forgiveness, Lord. Help us to repent daily of the things that we do that cause us to deny you. Help us, as you helped Peter, reconcile back to you, Lord. And help us to be the men and women and students that you have created us to be. We pray all these things in your Son, Jesus Christ's holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our way out of here.
victory beneath the cleansing blood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. Christ. Amen.